Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble, where you can see extended news coverage with biblical commentary. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The minute that um, Biden declared his withdrawal, the Taliban immediately declared victory before anything else happened. And that was echoed by jihadists all around the world. And they've been encouraged and inspired by this. Colonel Richard Kemp, former British commander in Afghanistan, sees Afghanistan becoming a major training ground for terrorists to attack the West. From those two things of having a safe haven again for terrorism, which we had tried to prevent by a 20 year campaign, um, and secondly, by empowering and inspiring jihadists all around the world, I think we are now about to enter a situation where the terrorist threat will be at least as high from Afghanistan as it was from the Islamic State when it controlled vast swathes of territory in Syria and in Iraq. And for Israel, the threat is immediate. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah says U.S. behavior during the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan indicates the moral downfall of America. They evacuated the dogs who worked in the security forces, but not those who aided them. They took out their equipment, but left the human beings behind. These are the Americans. Nasrallah called on those living in the region to draw specific conclusions from the Taliban victory. Then within hours, the Iranian-backed terrorist issued a warning about an oil tanker departing Iran bound for Lebanon. The tanker is coming from Iran and will sail in a few hours. I tell the Americans and Israelis that this is Lebanese territory. Earlier, senior Hamas official Musa Abu Marzouk praised the Taliban victory in a tweet. They confronted the Americans and its agents and refused to compromise with them. They were not deceived by bright headlines about democracy and elections. Hamas delivered another message in the form of a rocket, the first since May's 11-day war with Israel. While touring the site, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett sent his own message. We will operate at a time, a place, and in conditions that suit us, and not anyone else. As far as we're concerned, the address in Gaza is Hamas. Not rebellious groups or anybody else. Only Hamas. On Facebook, opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu posted about being invited to Afghanistan in 2013 by then-Secretary of State John Kerry. The message was clear. The Afghanistan model is the model the United States seeks to implement in the Palestinian matter as well. I politely refused the offer. I estimated then that once the U.S. leaves Afghanistan, everything will collapse. We will get the same result if, God forbid, we deliver the homeland to the Palestinians. Bennett is making his first trip to Washington to meet with President Biden. For Israel, Iran tops the agenda. According to the White House, they will discuss the Palestinian issue and global security as well as Iran. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. 
And it shall happen in that day, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6, that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49:36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. 
the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, you touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators 
who could each very easily fit the GOG profile. Taliban fighters marching through the streets, dressed in all white, the color of the Taliban's flag, and a symbol they're ready for martyrdom. <laughs> While outside the last remaining U.S. base at Kabul airport, chaos continues. This is what crowds have to face to get inside. Shooting, violence, Taliban whips. American troops worry if they open the gates, people will flood in. There's desperation and anguish. Marines confirmed the baby handed to them over a wall is now safe at the airport, reunited with family. Inside the base, U.S. troops play with the many children arriving, trying to keep them calm as Afghans are processed for departure and moved to the flight line. China and the world watched as the Taliban waltzed into power in Kabul this week and alarmed Afghans tussled to get out. The Chinese Communist Party warned Taiwan that U.S. humiliation in Afghanistan means Taipei cannot depend on America's help if war breaks out with China. American weakness on display for the whole world to see during the Afghanistan withdrawal fiasco is leading to a more dangerous world. President Biden, the U.S. Congress and Department of Justice must take immediate steps to not only protect U.S. citizens from Islamic terrorists that may now find a safe haven in Afghanistan, but also from Chinese cyber terror, spying, and the theft of America's most vital secrets. Our leaders must no longer stand idly by while Beijing does its thing robbing, stealing, and pillaging our nation's future. As many as 15,000 Americans and tens of thousands more Afghans who helped the U.S. military remain on the ground in Afghanistan, desperate to escape the Taliban. U.S. troops have restored some order inside the airport, but outside... Panic continues. Reports that at least 12 people have been killed this week due to gunfire or stampede as the Taliban blocks people, even some Americans with passports, from getting through checkpoints. President Biden says no matter when U.S. troops withdrew, chaos was sure to follow. Getting out would be messy no matter when it occurred. But a classified cable from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul to Secretary Blinken July 13th warned of the Taliban's swift gains and the collapse of the Afghan military and called for speeding up evacuations. Now the president faces criticism from America's NATO allies. This is the greatest debacle that NATO has seen since its foundation, and it is an ethical change we are facing, said Armin Laschet, who's expected to become the next German chancellor. In Britain, members of parliament united to hold President Biden in contempt, accusing him of throwing the UK and everybody else into the fire in a move they fear will embolden Russia and China. Like many veterans, this last week has been one that has seen me struggle through anger and grief and rage, the feeling of abandonment of not just a country, but the sacrifice that my friends made. And now America's European allies are looking inward. Frustrated with Biden's unilateral move, they say damaged and humiliated NATO. We can set out a vision, clearly articulated, for reinvigorating our European NATO partners to make sure that we are not dependent on a single ally, on the decision of a single leader. The threat of Tropical Storm Henri is looming over New England as the remnants of another storm system moves out to sea. Tropical Storm Fred leaving a path of destruction for days across the southern and mid-Atlantic states before soaking the northeast. All of a sudden the water started coming in through every room. At least two tornadoes confirmed in Pennsylvania. All of a sudden it got windy and windier and we thought, ah, this isn't good. And then we decided we better head to the basement. To flash flooding in Massachusetts, stranding drivers. My whole arm was just covered in mud and water. And I was like, oh, OK, we need to get out of here because this car is going to sink. In North Carolina, two are dead and at least 20 still missing after Fred dumped nearly a foot of rain, causing widespread flooding. We're going to always lean on that side of hope that we may find somebody that uh, that is still alive that needs our help. 
As communities are trying to recover from Fred, parts of the Northeast are preparing for Tropical Storm Henri, strengthening in the Atlantic and poised to become a hurricane this weekend. The storm's impact could stretch from New York's Long Island to Cape Cod and Maine. I am very concerned about this hurricane that's heading our way. And more extreme weather out west, with at least 100 active fires burning across 13 states. Just outside Sacramento, the counter fire exploding 10 times its size in just two days and forcing tens of thousands to evacuate. Firefighters struggling to contain the flames. It's resilient. It, it, it's stubborn. It won't, it won't go away. An unrelenting wildfire season, fueled by strong winds and dry conditions, now on pace to set new records. Well, tonight there is a desperate search to find about 20 people unaccounted for after the remnants of Tropical Storm Fred caused deadly flash floods in western North Carolina. CBS's Jesse Mitchell reports from on the ground. The search for the nearly two dozen unaccounted for runs as far and wide as the devastation itself. This is my house. The remnants of Tropical Storm Fred dropped more than a foot of rain in three days, turning homes into slow floating projectiles. There were copious amounts of water that came down those ridges and, uh, and inundated those communities. Nearly 100 people had to be rescued. First responders are following cell phone signals and 911 reports to find those still missing, many of whom they know personally. That's 47 miles of riverbank that we're going to have to look for potentially victims in the river that were washed down. Sherry Mincy said her home floated a half mile downstream as she watched from inside. All of a sudden, I felt this jerk and the trailer started floating down the river. The storm left behind an estimated $300 million in initial damage costs. It'll be months before the Mills Family Feed Store will be back in business. We've been able to reopen. A lot of these folks or businesses are gone. Our top story tonight taking us to Flagstaff with that severe flash flooding all caused by runoff from the museum fire burn scar. And our Nicole Gregg live with the very latest for us. Nicole, this is it's just dramatic to watch. It was scary to be honest with you watching that all come down and now everyone is left to clean up. Take a look at this mud. They've been trying to clear it out for the past few hours, but you can see how thick it still is. And then the homeowners over here, they are adding more sandbags to try to get that barricade higher up because they know that rain is supposed to come again, especially tomorrow. So everyone working together, but we have to get to that video. This is the video our cameras capturing as the floodwaters made its way down the museum fire burn scars. That water just so powerful as it makes its way down neighborhood streets. This is around East Linda Vista Drive. It's an area that has been hit repeatedly now by flash flooding. Now we have been here all afternoon and homeowners who spoke with us as this flooding was happening. You'll see just how emotional this is for so many of them. It's terrifying. It happens. This is the fourth time that this has come through, and every time it's worse. And so, you know, like I said, we rush home to try to man pumps and rebuild walls where the water's breaching. And I have to call the schools and tell them, you know, pull my kid out of class because they probably heard the alarms go off, and they're probably terrified because they've been here. You know when this has happened and, and say under no circumstances can you let my child walk home from school. You know, I have two kids who on either direction go to school within a mile of here and it's just, it's terrifying and it's going to happen again and again and again until something is done. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, 
each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. A horrific attack on a bank customer using an ATM machine. Man entered the vestibule with an ax and then began brutally attacking the customer. The victim survived and is in the hospital. We've all been there. You're at a cash machine. A stranger is hovering right behind you. But look, he's holding a hatchet. Out of nowhere, he attacks the customer. The stunned victim tries to shield himself. On and on it goes. It's too disturbing to show it all. The frenzy over, the crazed attacker smashes the cash machines and throws the hatchet away as he leaves. The nightmare happened at a bank in New York's financial district. 51-year-old victim of the attack is in intensive care. The suspect has been arrested and charged with attempted murder. Now to the other violent trend, groups of teens attacking complete strangers. Our Stephen Graves talked with the most recent victim. He was attacked last night in River North, and he's speaking up wanting more to be done. In this incident, this man says he was right here in River North with restaurants and bars. He was just walking when people walked up from behind him, started attacking, hitting him in the face. In the hospital, they told me that I was just a lucky guy because this could be like really worse. They, they thought I have to have like surgery or something. David Osorio still had blood on his clothes this afternoon after arriving home from the hospital. He was meeting up with his friends last night around 11. He says a group of guys who looked as young as 16 attacked him near Wells and Huron. After they hit him, he says he essentially played dead on the ground, but when he got up and went inside his car, he says the group ran back. The car was locked, so they banged on the windshield. You can see the cracked glass here. But Osorio says he got away driving to Stroger Hospital. He is the latest victim after police have warned of teens randomly attacking people in downtown just this week. 
even though we know that most of these kids are not going to be prosecuted because they're kids, right? And as I said, this is, for me, this is not a racial thing. This is not a political thing. We need to feel safe in Chicago. The killer of an elderly couple in California could be freed from prison next year if a state appeals court rules in his favor. Daniel Marsh murdered Oliver Northrup and his wife Claudia Maupin in 2013 when he was 15 years old. But a state law passed in 2018 prohibits anyone under 16 from being tried as an adult. And that could include him. 48 Hours correspondent Aaron Moriarty has been following this story for years. Aaron, good morning. It is very concerning. Good morning. We're still waiting on the court's decision in this case, and this is why it matters. There's a belief in this country, based on research, that young criminals can and should be rehabilitated. But California authorities say that Daniel Marsh may be an exception. Daniel Marsh, now 24 years old, is asking for an early release from prison. It's an appealable judgment under 1237. On Wednesday, his attorney, Mark Greenberg, argued before a remote panel of judges that Marsh should never have been tried and convicted as an adult, despite the horrific crime that he committed when he was just 15. Master bedroom. In 2013, Marsh, in search of victims, climbed through an open window into the home of 87-year-old Oliver Northup and his wife, 76-year-old Claudia Maupin. The elderly couple was asleep when Marsh stabbed Northup 61 times, Maupin 67. The case went unsolved for two months until police got a tip from a teenager who heard Marsh brag about the crime. What are you reporting? Double homicide. Marsh first denied any involvement. I don't hurt people. But after more than three hours of questioning by then FBI agent Chris Campion, Marsh admitted the unimaginable. Every time I look at someone, in my mind, I see flashes of images of me killing them. And he appeared to show no remorse. I'm not gonna lie, I felt amazing. <laughs> That's why Yolo County District Attorney Jeff Reisig charged Marsh as an adult. It was the most horrific, depraved murder I've ever seen as the district attorney in this county. In 2014, Marsh was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to 52 years to life. But four years later, the California legislature passed a law which prohibits any offender under the age of 16 from being tried as an adult, no matter how violent the crime. His lawyer wants him to be included in that law retroactively. But California Deputy Attorney General Rochelle Newcomb argued Marsh's verdict was final in 2018, and he shouldn't be allowed to drag the victim's family through never-ending appeals. Appellant's murders in this case have resulted in endless challenges for the victim's families, friends, and the community. But thankfully, the law and the facts that ensure appellant's continued incarceration are uncomplicated and straightforward. I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I want uh, to rest. I want my mom to rest. I want my family to rest. The victim's family watching from the district attorney's office now wait nervously for a decision. This man could be out on my street in less than a year, and there is absolutely nothing I can do about that. Yeah. Every morning for the last six weeks, when I wake up, my first thought is terror. The court's decision on Marsh's future could come at any time. And if the court rules for Marsh, he could be released as early as May 2022, next year, when he turns 25 years old. In earlier hearings, he said he's no longer a threat, but he's been diagnosed as a psychopath. And experts who have assessed him are divided over whether he could be rehabilitated. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Romans 128 through 32. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. There can be no doubt we are living in the end times right before Jesus Christ returns as we link 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 with Romans 1, 28 through 32. The phrase debased mind is found in Romans 1, 28 in reference to those whom God has rejected as godless and wicked. The Greek word translated debased is adokimos, which means unacceptable, that is, rejected, by implication, worthless. In Titus 1.16, the Apostle Paul refers to those whose works are debased. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. People who are classified as having a debased mind have some knowledge of God and perhaps know of His commandments, but they live impure lives and have no desire to please God. Those who have debased minds live corrupt and selfish lives and sin is justified and acceptable to them. The debased are those whom God has rejected and is left to their own devices. Can a Christian have a debased mind? Someone who has sincerely accepted Jesus Christ by faith will not have this mindset because the old person with a debased mind has been reborn into a new creation as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away Behold, all things have become new. Christians are basically new people. We live differently and speak differently. Our world is centered on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians have the Holy Spirit to help us live a God-honoring life, as we read in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Those with debased minds do not have the Spirit and live only for themselves. Christians have been given the Spirit of God as a gift, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man, speaking of the unsaved, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. through Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, 
the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance.